Welcome to Recollections, the Middle Tennessee Voices of Their Time series, a look at the past through the experiences of Middle Tennesseans. I'm Bob Bullen of Middle Tennessee State University, along with my guest, Mr. Education of Rutherford County, Baxter Hobgood, whose vision and leadership helped establish Murfreesboro City Schools as one of the premier school districts in the South. Baxter, along with his charming wife, Frances, an outstanding scholar and educator in her own right, became role models for many Middle Tennesseans aspiring to enter the teaching profession. Mr. Hobgood safely guided Murfreesboro City Schools through the stormy era of desegregation, established a building program for a growing community, while at the same time creating quality instruction in the classrooms of the Murfreesboro City Schools. As a coach, teacher, principal of Central High School, and for 30 years, superintendent of Murfreesboro City Schools, Mr. Hobgood set the example of what we mean by excellence and quality in education. Baxter, you've seen a lot of changes in your years in education. What impressed you most through that period of time? Well, I think we'd have to say that uh, by far the biggest change was the desegregation of schools. It came, as you know, at a time when uh, people were considering the question uh, and befuddled by it in many respects. But I think that we handled it in a way that uh, proved to be pretty good for this area. When we talk about your career later on as a superintendent, we'll come back to that, but you grew up in a segregated society over in North Carolina, so let's reflect on your earliest memories. What do you remember from your childhood? Well, that's right. I am a Tar Heel, and you could ask what I'm doing way over here in the, another state, the volunteer state. I grew up under circumstances that uh, were completely different from today, as you know. Uh, there were people who were very poor, people who were poor and people who were fairly well off. And I would have to say that we were in, most of the time, the very poor classification, ups and downs, but got along anyway. And I think in a large measure through the fact that families worked together perhaps better in those days than we found them uh, doing today. What, what was the name of the town you grew up in? The was little it town where I grew up is Roxboro, North Carolina, about 30 miles from Durham. Uh, very small town. I'd say now the city and the township combined would run somewhere but around 15 or 16,000. You lost your mother in an early age, so the biggest impression would be your father, I would think. Yes, I lost my mother when uh, I was about, oh, three years of age. My father married again uh, a couple of years later. I recall my mother through incidents that I've been told concerning her. You know, in those days, it was not unusual for many, many problems to occur during birth. And lost their mother when the second child was born. Both lived about 30 days after the second child was born. Your father was a hardworking man, but he was also a generous man. He took many people into, into your home, so you had a, you had a lively childhood, a lot of people around you, didn't you? Yes, he was a very generous person. I've, I've never seen him turn a person away who came asking for help, who wanted to spend the night or wanted to spend the year, black or white, made no difference to him who they were. In one way or another, the person was accepted and allowed to stay live with us in our home, provision made for them. Most of them made some contribution to us. I can remember only 
one incident that didn't turn out too well. Most of the time it was the, the person who had come by making uh, do in such a way that it was a help to all of us. Even though you lived in a segregated society, you were really very close to some members of the black community. I believe there was a, a lady you referred to as Aunt Cindy that was with your family. Yes, I, I think something that's often overlooked and something that, uh, I don't know, in this day and time, it might be a tendency to refer to it as a kind of an Uncle Tom situation. But this was not the case, really. Uh, all the way from the Civil War up until long after I was born, there were such times when the whole country, and particularly the area where we live, were in depression conditions. And oftentimes the poor white people and the black people uh, joined together in a kind of work ethic that was beneficial to both. And I know that, uh, well, at the time I was born, uh, Aunt Cindy was there with my mother. And she'd been with the family in so many ways uh, for many, many years and contributed to our welfare. In turn, my family tried to contribute to her welfare and her family. This was true to such an extent that uh, even, even today, our families, my family and Aunt Cindy's family, have a relationship that uh, to me has been wonderful. I recall that after I had come out here and stayed five years, I went back, and my second trip to visit anyone was to Aunt Cindy. And the good time I had with her, the joys we had at that first meeting, uh, have stayed with me all my life. You, uh, you were born in 1907, so you have quite a few memories before World War I. Do you remember uh, ever seeing any Confederate veterans? Yes, I saw Confederate veterans uh, meet uh, on the courthouse lawn two or three times in my early years. Did they make an impression on you of any type? Oh, yes. Uh, they did make an impression. The loyalty and goodwill that was demonstrated amongst those fellows who had gathered there for that celebration was something to behold. So they were a proud group that was revered by the community. That's right. Let's talk about some early experiences in school. Do uh, you remember your elementary school days and did you have any favorite teachers? Oh, yes. Uh, my early school days, I'd say my first five years were complete failure. <laughs> uh, that was due to a number of reasons. I was, uh, I was subject to the watch care of three old aunts that live with my father. And if there was a little rain or it looked like rain or snow or cold weather, Oh, uh, Baxter mustn't go to school today, which <laughs> I cool. And a couple of times I did have pneumonia, and pneumonia was rough in those days. There's no way to handle it, as before the days of uh, penicillin and so forth. But um, Describe a classroom, uh, an elementary classroom in those days. What? How did you spend the day? Well, I, uh, my first real good classroom work came in my sixth grade classes. 
Uh, the beginning of that year, I was confronted by a teacher who came out of Berea College. Now, I'm sure you know what that is. She had uh, lived in Somerset, Kentucky. She was poor herself, <laughs> and she'd come out of poor surroundings, and had got her education at, at Berea. I think when she looked at me, she must have seen a kind of kindred soul, because uh, from the very first day, I felt that, well, here's somebody who wants me to succeed and wants me to do well. And she practically told me so. And uh, from the day I entered her classroom till the day I was a junior in the late spring of 1929 here at what was then State Teachers College, I didn't miss a day in school. That's an admirable. Um, that's an admirable record. But I, I, I want you to tell a little bit about how a student in, in, in those pre World War One days would spend time in the classroom. What did you concentrate on in class? In this class, as I remember it, in the sixth grade, uh, with Miss Severs, she was known. It was uh, reading and writing. Read a while, write a while. Uh, this was one thing that impressed me so much. I don't know if I'd ever have learned to read if she hadn't been there. But uh, she wanted you to read and wanted you to write. Speaking was important then, wasn't it? Yes, speaking was important. And when you got into high school, it became very, very important. A lot of stress on the classics? A lot of stress on the classes. Classes were larger than they are now, of course, from 30 to 40 in a classroom. I, I was also referring to the classics, certain types of literature. Oh, yeah, yeah. classics, yes. There, and, and in the high school area, yeah. you, uh, they put emphasis on... What did a young fellow like you do for recreation? Well, I tried uh, all the sports that were provided uh, for us at the high school level. I guess I was never very good at any of them, better at baseball than, than any of them. But one way or another, I tried baseball, football, basketball. We never had a basketball floor or gym or anything. Where did you play those high school games? Oh... Tobacco warehouses, uh, those were huge things, and uh, places where the farmers brought uh, tobacco to be uh, sold during the selling season. So you just put two nets up, two goals up inside the warehouse and played on a dirt floor? Right. Uh, uh, one section of the warehouse. Uh, no, it, they had... Uh, uh, wooden floor, but uh, they put the two goals up uh, regulation size and uh, and played on those warehouse floors. Fairly rough, nothing smooth and pretty like today's courts. When you played baseball, did you have a good feel and did you have regular uniforms? We had regular uni uniforms. Uh, and uh, in the last years in my high school days, a good feel. But uh, prior to that time, we got a feel anywhere we could get it, anywhere we could play baseball. We, we played. Anything else you remember from I, your high school days? Incidentally, I have walked four miles for the privilege of playing a baseball game in the afternoon. So that was four there and four back, a round trip, four miles? Let, no, a round trip, eight miles. A round trip, eight miles. <laughs> Let me ask you about um, the flu epidemic in World War I. That made an impression on you. Yes. Uh, at somewhere near the close of the World War I, the 
flu epidemic hit in our state with a tremendous force. Uh, it wasn't unusual to find uh, three bodies in a room waiting for burial. And the only uh, firm in the city that handled barrels uh, came to my father and asked him if he would uh, hitch up an old-fashioned hearse and help them bury people, which he did. And through the remainder of the flu, rough part of the flu period, till he came down with it himself. But he recovered. A lot of your friends and neighbors did not recover from that epidemic. Oh, there were many who did not recover, even some of the family that did uh, recover. You told me that most families had the fear of going to the poorhouse and also that you had to work quite hard as a young man in high school. You worked in a Greek restaurant and I believe you held some other jobs. Could you reflect on that a little bit? Yes. Uh, the counties then, uh, most of them I suppose there and in this part of the country, maintained something that was called a poorhouse. But uh, any family considered it uh, shame, crying shame, if anyone in the family, uh, close kin or distant kin, had to resort to going to the poorhouse. It was a place to be avoided. And families got together and avoided going there with all their might. <laughs> of course, uh, in certain situations, people had to go there and spend the rest of their lives there. I recall one lady who, when she lost her son in the war, had no means of support whatsoever. And she went to what was called the poorhouse. And there she remained waiting for her son to come and get her. Of course, he would never come back. But um, I would ride by when I visited home later on to see if she was still there. And she would always be at the window uh, waiting for that son to come home. That's a, that's a tragic story. That's tragic. And one summer when I was back, I missed it. And they, someone remarked that the son had really come and got it. She, she thought all along he, had, uh, he would come. And, uh, yeah. Of community. course, he, he, was, he had gone on, but that no. was just no, I, <laughs> the story they told that he had come and got it. <laughs> It's a good way to have and an ending. That's what she believed. Yeah, well, that's a good way to have an ending to that. Yeah, it is. Now you worked awful hard. You you were trying to be a scholar in high school. You were trying to be an athlete, but you had to put in long hours in a in a restaurant. Tell me about I that. I remember that in my senior year in high school, I worked in a Greek restaurant, and uh, the people were very good to me, and yet uh, I worked regular hours if I. Uh, went on an athletic trip or something of this sort, came in late. I still worked till midnight. And when I wasn't on a trip of any sort, I started at, oh, 30 minutes or an hour right after school and worked till midnight. Usually somewhere between uh, 7 or 8 o'clock and uh, Midnight would might have a couple of hours off, depending on what our particular job was for that occasion. There was also a small hotel uh, combined with the restaurant. And uh, after I had been there a while, the manager uh, 
put me in charge of uh, taking the revenue at midnight to the place where it was supposed to be. Well, the community was safe. You never had to worry about being robbed or threatened no, in any no, way. No, you didn't worry about that in those days. People left their homes unlocked? I don't recall a lock ever being on our door at any time. So neighbors worked together. You had to learn to take care of yourself at an early age, though, didn't you? I, I think there was a great deal more pride in being able to avoid asking somebody for something. Uh, it seems to me today that uh, we've lost a little of that. Uh, You're referring to a dependence on the government to help you out if you right. get in trouble. Right. People just never thought of that in your early years. There was no government help. You just, it wasn't that. Some way or another, you got along. And uh, I think that uh, uh, independent spirit has been trampled a little bit. Some people, in fact, take a little advantage of the situation, as I see it. But, uh, Tell me about your high school graduating class. How many of them were they, and were they a successful group later on? Oh, yes. I think there were maybe 28 in the class, 28, 30, something this sort. And I recall that a uh, uh, number of them uh, had uh, very successful careers. One that I remember so well was a uh, fellow by the name of Winston, we called him Champ, who became a corporate lawyer soon after his graduation from the University of North Carolina. And uh, I suppose even today that he's an advisor to that corporate group, whoever it is, the last I heard. Uh, and he was a corporation lawyer. Uh, others who did well in other fields. I don't recall another one that entered the field of education of those well, some graduates. Let's move along to an era that you really like to talk about, the, the time you moved from North Carolina to uh, be with your uncle in Nashville and then on, on to college. So tell me how you managed to leave the Tar Heel State and come over and join us. How I managed to get to <laughs> State Teachers College? Yes, sir. What, what happened to move you from one um, region to another? When I graduated in 1930, uh, uh, I came to live with an uncle in Nashville. He was a younger brother of my father. And my father had been out on one occasion when this uncle was sick and helped get him back on his feet. And when I finished high school, this uncle wrote me and asked me why I didn't come on out and work for him. Now, what year was that you graduated from high school? 1926. 1926. And I came to Nashville and worked that summer with this uncle in ice and coal business in Nashville. And at the end of the summer, he, uh, he said, why don't you go down to Murfreesboro and go to school during this next three quarters, come on back next summer and work and do this until you have a degree. Before we get into talking about coming to Murfreesboro, tell me about slinging ice in Nashville and describe <laughs> Nashville as you remember it in the, in the Roaring Twenties. Well, my job that he gave me there in his ice organization was to manage a substation where ice was stored and incidentally sold to the public. And these uh, blocks of ice weighed 300 pounds. And uh, you had to learn how to handle them to get them in the storeroom, to 
uh, cut them so that you are sure you were giving the customer uh, the right weight and a lot of things that demanded a little bit of skill. And this was an interesting kind of thing because uh, I expanded the job a little bit. Uh, there were some independent dealers in the neighborhood where I worked and I got my uncle to arrange it in such a way that I could sell them that wholesale ice that they needed. And about three o'clock in the morning, they'd put the ice 300 pound blocks on a platform. And I had arranged with these independent dealers that they would just come by and pick it up about 3.30 and come back about 4 or 4.30 and pay me for it. They went on out on their rides. And uh, they almost promoted me for thinking up that idea that, that summer, but uh, it was an interesting kind of thing. Getting up at 3.30, 4 o'clock in the morning wasn't too interesting, but... Well, your career could have taken a turn and you, you could have become a businessman in Nashville if you'd stayed with it. At the end of the four-year period when I finished my work here. Uh, this whole business was under a corporation in uh, Atlanta known as the American uh, Service Corporation. And the manager of this area came to me and offered me a job and uh, I, I said, I don't like this idea of getting up at three and four o'clock in the morning. He said, oh no, we don't mean that. You'll have a supervisory place if you want it. Do you remember anything about Nashville at that time? Did you ever go see the Nashville Vols play? Occasionally, not often because I didn't have the time, but there was one day when I insisted on getting somebody to work for me and uh, letting me go down to see them play. And that was the day that Babe Ruth came to town. So you saw Babe Ruth? I saw the Babe. Well, to tell me your impressions. You surely have a vivid memory of that day. I remember that um, they had suggested to Babe that he not play that platform yeah. up in right field where they would pray, uh, afraid he'd hurt himself. Yeah, Sulphur Dale was a unique ballpark. It had right. A, the right field area had a slope to it. Had a slope to it and uh, was just a very short distance from uh, home plate. Matter of fact, they had put a screen up over it by this time to keep um, too many home runs from being hit. Uh, the um, thing that impressed me was Babe insisted, no, no, you're not going to put somebody there in my place. I'm going to play that field. So he got up on that little smooth platform <laughs> and, and played that field and uh, played out the game. I, he didn't get a home run himself that day, but uh, he did knock one against the wire and, and enjoyed seeing the whole that that was a nice memory. Uh, reflecting on your baseball career, you really had hopes of playing more, but you got hurt in high school, and that, that stopped your career, didn't it? Right. Uh, I had hoped to play some baseball. Uh, I told you about that tobacco warehouse yes, sir. floor. Uh, that floor had a patch, and it uh, at one spot, and as luck would have it, I put my foot against that patch one night and pivoted all the way around. The patch held the foot and I heard something pop and uh, since that day I've had a bad left knee. They couldn't do anything with it. And, uh, I'm sure today they could, but in those days they couldn't either in Roxborough or Nashville. 
Well, we might have known you as Baxter Hobgood, second baseman for the Boston Red Sox. No, I never would have. <laughs> I never would have gotten that far. I wasn't that good, but I had hoped to make the team here. And as a matter of fact, went out and and uh, tried and made it. But one windy day in an effort to catch a hard hit drive to left field, uh, misjudged the fly and stopped real quickly. Top knee went again and that was it. That was it for good that time. That was good for good that time. Well, let's talk about what you found when you came to Murfreesboro, known as State Teachers College then, a very small uh, college, but a lot of middle Tennesseans came here and it did have a good faculty, so this was your first exposure to higher education, and, and tell me what happened to you when you arrived in Murfreesboro. Well, uh, I, I came up, I remember the first day, my uncle's wife had been to school here, and normal days, and came up uh, with her, and she introduced me to the president. And when we got in, we found that all the rooms were gone uh, in the dormitory. And uh, Mr. Lyon told me to uh, go over to the dormitory and check with the janitors over there and see if anybody had turned down a room or if there was any place at all that uh, could be used. So I went over and uh, got to talking with the janitors and found that uh, on each floor, first, second, and third, they had janitors' rooms where they kept all the janitor equipment used on that floor. And the fellows also had some of the furniture out in the hallway moving it in from one place to another and fixing up the rooms. And by looking over that room and kind of measuring that furniture in my mind's eye, I found out that uh, a bed and a dresser and one small table would go in that room uh, without any problem. It'd be a place you could live for a while. And uh, I asked one of the janitors if they'd be willing to put their stuff down on the second floor and let me put uh, my things uh, in that room and use it for a bedroom. They told me to come over and talk with Ed and then to talk with Mr. Lyon. Ed was a chief janitor of the school. So in that way, uh, I found a place to stay. How much did they charge you well, for Well, I asked Miss Lyon how much I should pay, and he uh, said, oh, five dollars. <laughs> I, I said, uh, five dollars a month, a quarter, Oh, five dollars for a quarter, be all right. Uh, give it to Mr. Holmes when you go down to register, and uh, that'll be fine. So the school was on the quarter system then, and, yes. and you remember how much tuition you paid? Very small amount. Uh, they let me register from Nashville. If I'd had to register from North Carolina, there would have been an out-of-state fee. fee. But, fee. They, but, but they uh, counted Nashville. They let me. Uh, register. How many students here? Four or five hundred maybe? Uh, in the first two quarters you'd have uh, five to six hundred. In the last part, last six weeks and first six weeks of the summer term, I didn't stay for the summer term, but the last Six weeks of the third quarter, the first 
six weeks of the summer quarter, 1800. A lot of those students worked. Worked. And they had jobs for them on campus to People do that. People who were working uh, on two-year certificates and this sort of thing came back to further the education and finally get that degree. Well, you were a North Carolina boy among uh, Tennessee uh, kids. Uh, how did you get along with them, and what was life like in the dorm? Oh, wonderful. I, I don't know why I was accepted so uh, freely and happily, and why, why I enjoyed it so much from the very first day the, on my camp. I didn't want to go back to Nashville. Murfreesboro was my place when when I came up here and found out uh, what life was like on the college campus and how the people all of them uh, responded to a kinky-headed guy that had come out of North Carolina. And I recall that uh, oh, just a couple of months ago uh, we buried a lifelong friend who uh, loved this institution and uh, thought of it even through seven years after he'd had a terrible stroke. You want to mention his name? Yes, he was uh, J. Elmer Molly Malone. Okay, I, I remember you telling me about Molly Malone, a, a good athlete, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, he uh, was a freshman that same year that I was. And I met him as I was coming back from my trip over to find a room. And uh, he insisted all his life that I was the first guy he met when he came to <laughs> campus. And really, he was the first guy I met when I came to campus. And we maintained that friendship through Two, two weeks later, I was with him in his home in Dowtown, enjoying a sumptuous meal and uh, visiting with his family. Mr. Hobgood, I want you to, as best you can, give me a good visual picture of what the campus looked like when you came here. Now, we've changed so much through the years, and oh, it'd be nice to try to record this. What did the campus look like? Only about five, no. We had Old Main, of course, mm -hmm. Boys Dormitory. Which would be Jones Hall. Used to be Jones Hall. Uh, girls Dormitory, Rutledge Hall. The cafeteria, which is now the alumni, alumni center. And the library. Was didn't, the li have, didn't have a library. The library wasn't there then? The library was... Uh, on the second floor of Old Main. And uh, in my junior year, I helped carry the books from the second floor of Old Main to the new library out in the center of the... So you saw them build the new saw library? Saw them build it. And, and that's where uh, uh, Peck Hall stands now. Describe the old library, which, of course, was the new library to you. Well, of course, there were not many volume there. There were few books as far as uh, trying to compare it to libraries of today. And these books centered around, we mentioned a while ago, the uh, uh, areas of the classics, the um, political science books, uh, uh, some in the sciences, uh, and uh, that's about it. I, they, they, they just were not organized as they. I are. understand it was a it was a beautiful little building. Is it was true? a beautiful little building, and uh, we enjoyed it very much. Many activities took place on the uh, lower floor 
used it for an activity room. I understand some people in the community were upset when they tore that building down that perhaps it could have been preserved. I suspect so. I didn't hear too much about it, but uh, there were people who regretted seeing it uh, leave the campus. Well, the 1920s were an exciting time. Was there much excitement on this campus? What did students do for recreation? And tell me about the sports scene on our campus then. Well, uh, the, there, there was little to do, recall, at that time. Uh, we didn't even have radio, much less television. And uh, there was little to do except whatever association you had with each other. Uh, you almost had to have a girlfriend around somewhere. <laughs> uh, or you had little in the way of social life. So you spent part of your time over at Rutledge Hall. Not too much in, in Rutledge Hall, but uh, this is uh, hmm. Ms. Rutledge, I guess, was her name. Uh, would oftentimes delay the ringing of the bell. And boys and girls could sit out uh, between Old Main and Rutledge Hall uh, for 30 minutes and sometimes for an hour. That was before the curfew. Before curfew. So you had a ringing of the bell to tell the girls it was time to come in. Time to come in. So you and, remember this Mrs. And Rutledge. And going to town at night alone uh, for a girl was out of the question. It just couldn't be done. Were there any cars on campus? Two. <laughs> Two cars on campus. Uh, Were they owned by students or the faculty? No, one by Mr. Horace Jones, who later became, uh, uh, I suppose, our first uh, director of athletics here yeah, on the campus and the other by student. Can you give me a, a, a picture of the president at that time, Mr. Lyon? What uh, was his relationship with the faculty and with students, and what type of man was he? At the time that I came, uh, Mr. Jones was a uh, very popular figure. The people liked him, the people uh, around town liked him. That was Mr. Jones, right? Uh, oh, Mr. I Lyon. Meant, I meant Mr. Lyon. All right, Mr. Lyon. Jones was a president before. There was also a Jones that was president before Lyon. Is that is that right? You never yes. saw him, though, did you? Yes. So he was uh, a, I, believe, I guess he was his father, Mr. Horace Jones. Yeah. Uh, but you never saw him, did you? Yes, I saw oh, him. Oh, you did? Uh, but this was, I saw him after he had uh, left the campus and had accepted another. I guess he became uh, uh, head of the Department of Ed State Department of Education. I believe he did. Then uh, Mr. Lyon had been a superintendent of Murfreesboro City School. Now, that's something difficult to explain because Murphy didn't have any school. Well, I guess you better explain yourself now. You've got us in a mystery here. 1892, the legislature passed a law creating a Murfreesboro city school system. But Murfreesboro had no public schools. And Mostly, the purpose of passing that law was to enable someone in the city of Murfreesboro to pass on some money so that those who were at least able to attend school could go to one or another of the outstanding private schools uh, in Murfreesboro and in Rutherford County. Public education was a long time developing. 
uh, in Marsborough and Rutherford County, as exemplified by the fact that the first time there was a four-year public high school in Rutherford County, in uh, Murfreesboro, 1918-1919. Mr. Mitchell had something to Mr. do with that. Mr. Mitchell. Uh, and it, it came about uh, because Murfreesboro at that time had agreed in a contract with the county to build Central High School down in front of the Critchlow building where the uh, Electric Corporation is located now. Uh, some of the football players have been coming to normal school to be coached by uh, the normal coach. And he found out that year that he was not going to have time to coach any high school fellows. So a group of these boys, uh, like John Woodfin, father of the present uh, Woodfin operator, Woodfin Funeral Home, and um, Hollis Donald, Tarbert Donald, uh, several others uh, got together and went to the chairman of the board and asked them to let Mr. Mitchell come on over here from Fayetteville, where he was in a private school, and get a four-year school started uh, in the old Mooney Anderson building on East Main Street. Both they had been private schools, Mooney first and then Anderson later on. They, um, they didn't expect to have much success, but lo and behold, the board agreed and Mr. Mitchell agreed to come on. and he brought about four or five teachers with him. So we see something that's typical now, the influence of sports in establishing a school. Yes, and that, a uh, whole lot of that in Murfreesboro was due to what came out of the Mooney-Anderson situation. In Mr. Mooney's case, incidentally, he came from BGA. Is that located on East Main Street in what's right. now the Arnett home? Was. It was on the uh, south side of East Main Street. And uh, in Mr. Mooney's mind, uh, you, you, you weren't much of a fella if you didn't play football. <laughs> and uh, same with Mr. Anderson. And he went so far as to build dormitories for his boys. And uh, the Louis, where the Louisa School is now was a dormitory for Mooney boys. And uh, there were two on East Main Street, pretty homes now. I, I think I could identify them, I'm not sure. But they became uh, dormitories for his boy. So Mr. Lyon then had that background with the city school system before he came over to the State Teachers College. Is that, is that what you're telling me? Well, not Mr. Mr. Lyon's main job was to find those youngsters who couldn't go anywhere and provide them uh, with a little bit of money so that they might attend a private school. Uh, 
Well, give me. I a believe it was 1918, not much before 1918, that the first public school was built there, where the Critchlow Office Building is now, because. Uh, so the citizens in Murfreesboro basically depended on the county school system. Uh, a few. Some of them went to private schools. They went to private schools, and uh, when normal school was organized, a goodly number came out here. Oh, that's right. The normal school also had the lower grades in it. That, right. That, that's correct. Lower grade. Yeah. But, but never uh, to the point where they could have a four-year program and a four-year football team was what uh, was wanted at uh, 1918 when the boys got another colorful figure who uh, attended that school was uh, Jesse Beasley. You know whether you remember? Yes, sir. He was a sculptor that uh, right and lived he on Mile Street. So very active in organizing. The Line Bar Library did a tremendous amount of work. So you knew him as a young man? I didn't particularly know him as a young man. I, I just read about the fact that he and several others in that 1918 uh, program uh, suggested the uh, colors to be used, suggested the name Central High School, and uh, believe it or not, were active in the ROTC uh, for that year. Well, that's a good bit of information on that. Let me pull you back to your days on campus before this first section ends. Uh, give me that brief description that I'd like to get of Mr. Lyon uh, as, as a person and as a president. What do you remember? Well, I, as I started to say a while ago, he, uh, in the beginning, was uh, very much played, very active in the community. Uh, Lions Club, uh, not Lions Club, the Rotary Club, uh, various other uh, organizations, and very, very active, and generally favored. There came a time when uh, People on the campus began to say, well, look, this man doesn't even have a college degree. He's never had a college program. We must begin to think in terms of growing, reorganizing, developing a different kind of program on campus. And this was... Um, there was one man in particular who felt that uh, this uh, should be done. I wouldn't want to name that person because people still living. Yeah. So Mr. Lyon's contract was not renewed eventually, wasn't that the story? That's right. It, uh, but he was a good man, a good president, they said. I thought so. Well, let's talk a little bit about your classroom activities. You took your work seriously uh, as a student in college. And you had some favorite teachers. Tell me about your first class and, and, and your favorite teacher. What do you mean? Uh, my good friend, uh, Dr. Gillenheim. Yes. Yes, she was my favorite teacher. Uh, I guess because I became one of her favorite pupils again, <laughs> uh, or students. I can't think of any other reason. I do recall that I entered my first class the morning I entered this old kinky-headed North Carolina uh, boy, scared to death, got as far back in the back row as he could get and uh, slumped down hoping no one would see him. And Dr. Gillentine stood up and said, uh, hey, you with uh, your Marcel in your hair back there, <laughs> get up and go over and the gray cottage and go up on the second floor and bring me those papers on the trunk. Uh, we got five minutes. And uh, so I 
got up with, I thought, everybody watching me, went outside and uh, asked someone uh, to direct me to Gray Cottage. And they said, well, there it is, right over there. And I, I looked at them, I said, that's a cottage? <laughs> and they said, yes, I was looking for a little frame house with uh, roses growing up around the side and uh, white fence out in front and all this sort of thing. But I found out all of those houses up and down East Main Street, uh, East Tennessee Boulevard, were referred to as uh, cottages. So I went to the second floor and got the materials and brought them back and put them on a desk. And make a long story short, uh, I stayed in a class and made the B that first uh, quarter. The second quarter, she gave an intelligence test right at the beginning of the year. And uh, I found out in checking over it, I scored very low. I found out in checking over it that every question I had uh, marked uh, right, the aid, her helping her grade papers, had marked incorrectly. He'd placed his form over the answers incorrectly. I brought this paper to her and showed it to her and um, told her I was trying to make a good grade. She simply took the paper and tore it up completely. And I said, Ms. Dr. Gillentine, I wanted to make good grades this quarter. She said, Baxter Hobgood, from now on, the only thing you have to do to make an A in my class is to come to it. I was surprised, but uh, I said, uh, well, I'll beat all of them. And I did. I, I'm sure I don't have many more than those five A's. Mr. Hobgood, that's a good way to wind up part one. And this concludes part one of our discussion with Baxter Hobgood, retired superintendent of schools in Murfreesboro. And when we return with part two, we'll talk about how he met his wife and started his teaching career and get on into his career as a principal with uh, the uh, local high school and then as a superintendent. Thank you for watching. Thank you.